Hello guys, welcome to my next Monday Bagel episode. My guest is Professor Marek Kowalkiewicz, Chair in Digital Economy of Queensland University of Technology, but also the author of a book, The Economy of Algorithms, where there is a chapter on robotic lawyers. Marek, it's great you joined this podcast. Thanks for having me, Michał, and uh, great to see you here. Marek, could you describe a bit what is the economy of algorithms? This podcast is directed to lawyers, so maybe they are not very aware of what you write about. Of course. The economy of algorithms is a, is a fascinating phenomenon that uh, has been emerging in the past few years. It is a a relatively new type of economy where we have noticed an emergence of a new type of an economic agent. So an economic agent is an entity that can create or consume value in, uh, in the economy. Uh, so traditionally, we would uh, consider two types of economic agents. That is people, you know, people can create value, they can create products, intellectual property, and so on and so on. People can also consume value by purchasing goods and services. And in a similar way, and for a while now, we've also had this other type of economic agents, and that's corporations. Corporations themselves can have that agency or, a, you know, there can be a legal entity. And again, as such, they can create value and consume value, right? So when we buy a car, it's a car produced by Ford or Toyota or Tesla, right? So an organization rather than an individual behind it. And again, they can also purchase, uh, they can also consume goods and services. That's traditional economy in a way. But in the past few years, we've seen this new phenomenon, and that's algorithms, effectively pieces of software, call them bots, call them AI, whatever you want to call them. We're talking about algorithms, computer algorithms that can produce value and that can, that can also consume value. So if you've ever gotten a, you know, a, a chatbot to write a piece of text for you and perhaps you paid for the services of the chatbot, you know, a dollar or ten, twenty dollars a month, that's, you know, the bot generating value in the economy. And in a similar way, some of those bots can also consume value. And we can talk about it later as well, but there are bots that hire people to perform tasks. There are bots that buy services from other bots. So those are the new economic agents. And the economy of algorithms is an economy that contains not only humans and organizations, but also algorithms in itself. But do you think that this economy of algorithms can touch legal world as well or legal profession as well? Absolutely. You have the concept of algorithmic minions. Should we await them in legal world? Oh, oh, yes, they are already there. There's no point waiting. It's just a matter of who works with them and who doesn't. So uh, the concept of digital minions that I use is basically a metaphor to talk about those algorithmic agents in a way that's easier to understand. So it's, you know, I'm trying to make this concept less academic and more lifelike. And so digital minions are effectively those algorithms that perform certain tasks for us. And I love the metaphor because it reminds us also about the movie, the Minions, where you have plenty of those and they're very keen and they really want to help you. But occasionally, sometimes quite often in those movies, they also create a lot of havoc and a lot of destruction. So back to the lawyer profession, we're already seeing uh, examples of lawyers using generative AI to help them with their work. We've seen the, the sort of the more hilarious or bad examples where we heard about lawyers using generative AI to collect cases that they would, you know, discuss in front of a court. And that led to all sorts of unintended consequences. But the main one is the fact that those lawyers were using tools that hallucinate or create cases that never existed. They were not aware that generative AI would hallucinate information. So, you know, the intention is there, just, you know, just lack of alignment in tools. But having said that, there are absolutely appropriate ways of using generative AI by lawyers. One example would be to summarize the documents that they need to read through. So, you know, to get a quick overview of those documents. Another one would be to do some write-ups where generative AI creates text that the lawyers use as a draft and fix all of the problems that are with it. You know, it saves, saves a lot of time. So definitely there's quite a lot of cases where generative 
generative AI is quite usable in this space. And based on my experience, I can tell you there's already a lot of lawyers that are using generative AI. I can tell you the same. Uh, we conducted a report where over half of the respondents said that they already use generative AI. But what is robo lawyer you describe in your book? Uh, is it a person using AI or this minion helping lawyers in some tasks or something else? It's like Robocop. Is this a human or is this a robot? And it's a bit of a concept of, you know, that smells of a cyborg. But the term robo lawyer specifically, the way it's used at the moment, it is effectively a digital minion. It is a piece of software. And there is a particular robo lawyer that some of the listeners might be aware of. It's called Do Not Pay. It's a service that launched in 2015 in the US with the sole purpose of helping individuals with small cases that not very often, but sometimes would require the help of a lawyer. I think the first use case for Do Not Pay was contesting parking tickets. So whenever you receive a parking ticket, you could reach to your local authority and, and, and try to get it get it cancelled. That particular robo lawyer do not pay has fully automated the creation of all the letters that would, would need to be written in, in this process. So imagine going to a website which says, please provide all your inf all the information about your ticket. What, are, what were the circumstances? We'll draft a letter for you to submit and get those tickets canceled. The founder of the organization back in 2018, so three years after Do Not Pay was launched, claimed that they processed 250,000 of such requests. We cannot verify this number, so it was a statement by the CEO, but if it's true, it's really, really impressive. And Do Not Pay has expanded now and really looking into all sorts of other cases. I heard or I saw on their website that they even offer a marriage annulling or annulation service. Okay. We met during the conference in Poznan, where you presented five levels of work automation, starting from the work that is not automated at all until the fully automated job on the fifth level where everything is done by the robots. Do you think on which level in legal world are we now and up to which level will automate our job? Great question. So, Michal, that's something I'm very passionate about, the idea that we shouldn't be talking about this binary world where something is either fully human or something is fully automated. And I borrowed those levels of automation from the levels of automation of autonomous vehicles or automated vehicles. So when you, you know, if you drive a Tesla, it's a particular level. I believe Tesla is classified as a level two. There's very few cars. I think it's only Mercedes at the moment that has a level three car that we all can buy. There's only a few of those. Until we get to level five, which is a no steering wheel type of automation, so you don't even have a steering wheel in the car, definitely not something that a, you know, a, a regular person can buy. So I use the very same metaphor for algorithms and digital minions, saying that in most cases, when we work with algorithms and digital minions, we will be somewhere on this spectrum. There are hopefully very few people who are not automated at all. Most of us, and that includes lawyers, will use some level of automation of our work. And this could be as simple as, you know, spell checking the documents that we mm -hmm. write. That's also a level of automation, but this is probably, you know, sort of level one, which is equivalent to using cruise control in your car. You're still in charge, but there's a tiny bit of help that you, that you have that makes your life easier. So where are lawyers in this space? There's no single answer to it because it really depends on the task that we're performing. And my take, which, you know, through my experience with other professions, would be that when it comes to very simple, repetitive, call them stock standard legal cases, that automation could be going, going pretty, pretty high. I'm currently working with lawyers in transport injury or, you know, transport insurance area. And that's where I see it for very, very simple accidents where there's a bump, you know, between one car and the other. There's a lot of automation of those activities, mm -hmm. creation of all the documentation and so on. But then you take it to the other end of the spectrum when there's a very severe accident and, you know, claims might be very, very high. This is where humans still do most of the work and the automation is just kind of 
on the edges. So I guess that's my answer. The more repetitive, the more predictable a task there is, the more automation we're going to see in the legal world. But there will be those cases which are complex, those that are very unique, that I'm not expecting to see a lot of automation, and not in the next few years at least. And uh, is it possible that lawyers are replaced and bots conduct hearings, conduct proceedings, probably uh, advises to the people provide full legislation information? For very simple cases, I think a technologist would say that it's possible. But when you look at it in, from a broader perspective, there are still so many issues that cannot be solved through technology. Only. And the one that comes to my mind that's the most obvious, the most glaring, is the ethics and the bias in those in those tools. So there's a, a challenge with any artificial intelligence tool. You know, the data that they're trained on inherently has bias in it because that's us, that's humans that create the data. So if we're training an AI algorithm on, say, decisions of judges in the past, each of those judges will have their personal biases, right? You know, whether we want to avoid that or not, they are humans and as such, they always will have that. So inadvertently, those, those biases end up in the training data and then they are often multiplied or enhanced or amplified by the algorithms. And being able to spot where those biases are and then removing them is a massive challenge. Well, the ethics itself is a massive challenge because whose ethics are we talking about? You know, this, this sort of Western world world ethics that I think everyone assumes that this is what we were trying to implement in those systems. But the answer needs to be asked, right? Is this the right ethics to be you know, implemented in those systems? But Miha, I, I did want to comment on one other thing about the replace. One other thing when it comes to the replacement of, of lawyers, I think there's a challenge in the whole process here, because if we have algorithms that can perform those simple tasks, those algorithms are replacing people that would otherwise perform those simple tasks, which is interns, which is people who are only starting within the profession. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit worried about this gap that we're going to you know, create where young people will not have the opportunity to learn the, the sort of the most fundamental skills of the legal profession because those most fundamental skills of the legal profession will be taken over by, uh, by the algorithm. So here's a task and a challenge for all the legal professionals who are listening to us at the moment. Think about how are you going to both automate your profession if that's your goal, but also maintain that opportunity for newcomers into the industry to learn. This was going to be my last question, how to teach young people and how to invite them to the profession who replaces us if we use AI only. This is a very big open question. Do you have any answer how to teach youngsters and how to make them become lawyers? I think we need to recognize that the legal profession will evolve with technology. Just like tax accountants had to evolve the moment spreadsheets and you know tax accounting software emerged. Those spreadsheets and those pieces of software replaced some of the tasks that were being performed. So the profession itself has evolved, including the sort of the more senior members of that of that profession. And so in a similar way, we, we need to start imagining the legal profession of the future. I personally do not believe that we will ever see full automation of the profession. I am of a, a strong conviction that we will see the kind of digital minion scenario where when you think about the movie, there was Gru in that movie who would manage all of those minions. And so to me, we need to help those young people understand how to manage algorithms and how to make them do things that they want them to be doing. It's actually not very easy to get generative AI to, to do a good job. So we will still need those sort of human managers of algorithms. We will become, or they will become uh, much more efficient than the lawyers of today are, but humanity will still be required in this scenario. So it's a perfect last word for our fabulous discussion. Marek, thank you for joining us. You all who listen, subscribe Marek's newsletter, Substack. It's brilliant. Buy Marek's book, who is to be published very soon. And join our next episodes of Monday Bible. Marek, thank you for, for being here. Thanks so much, Michal.